Hello, I welcome you to Sunday School with First United Methodist Church of Camden, Arkansas. I'm Ellen Horseman. We are looking at a study by Tom Berlin called Courage, Jesus, and the Call to a Brave Faith. So, last week we talked about clarity. Uh, that to have courage, it's, it, it's essential to be clear about what God is calling us to do. So this week I want to look at another aspect of courage, and that is conviction. Sometimes we don't have enough conviction, I guess, to give us courage. And so we may have an inkling that God is calling us to something, but we fail to act. Maybe because uh, we're afraid that we'll be criticized, or we're afraid that we might upset some people, or we, we will be judged. Let's read a story where Jesus could have balked, balked in the same way that we do uh, because of fear of criticism. So this is uh, Luke chapter 13, and we're going to begin with verse 10. Jesus uh, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. A woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and couldn't stand up straight. Okay, so I'm going to stop for a minute and just kind of get in our situation. Jesus is in a synagogue, and, and when he sees this woman that's bent over, I'm pretty sure that Jesus immediately feels compassion for her. But more than that, he, he feels like he, he must do something and do it now. Now, is that going to cause a problem? Jesus is well aware of the fact that it is the Sabbath, and that technically it's considered uh, sinful to heal, uh, forbidden to heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus goes on. Uh, when he saw her, Jesus called her to him, and he said, Woman, you are set free from your sickness. He placed his hands on her, and she straightened up at once and praised God. Well, of course, we think, Everybody should be rejoicing because look what Jesus has done and look how this woman has, has been cured and she's no longer stuck with this terrible, terrible physical deformity. But of course, that's not what happens. The, uh, here's what Luke says. The synagogue leader was incensed that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he responded, there are six days during which work is permitted. Come and be healed on those days and not on the Sabbath. Well, the Lord replied, hypocrites, don't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from its stall and lead it out to get a drink? Then isn't it necessary that this woman, a daughter of Abraham, bound by Satan for 18 long years, be set free from her bondage on the Sabbath day? And when he said these things, all his opponents were put to shame, but all in the crowd rejoiced at all the extraordinary things he was doing. You see, Jesus was acting in the face of what he knew would be probable criticism and maybe being ostracized from the synagogue and maybe worse than that. Remember, his own uh, town had tried to throw him off a cliff earlier. But he, he has conviction, Jesus does, that God has called him, uh, as he said in, in the fourth chapter, uh, that God has called him, as Isaiah said, to free or liberate the oppressed. And this woman, he said, had to be freed from the bondage of this physical infirmity. And so because he has that conviction, he's able to act with courage. That's what conviction does for us. Tom Berlin uh, puts it this way. He says, courage arises from the God-inspired convictions we hold about how the world should work and what we should do to care for and to support others. Jesus teaches us that it is important, even necessary, to hold conviction that is rooted in God's love and mercy. Jesus shows us that we must not defer from action for fear of conflict. When God calls, it is no time to avert your eyes or hope that it was intended for someone else. So conviction implies that we believe that our calling to live out the love of Christ is important. As a matter of fact, it's vital, and it's vital enough to take risk. And we understand 
that just because we're doing God's will doesn't mean that we're going to be, that everything's going to work out fine, that there's not going to be any problems. <laughs> and all you have to do is look at scripture to see that that's true. So what can give us this kind of conviction uh, that would lead to courage and action? Well, a lot of it is faith. Faith in the way that God has created the world. Faith in the God who has set me free, in the God that has set you free. Faith in the God who has given us grace and love and mercy that we don't deserve. It is seeing uh, and having faith in a God that's created the world that Micah describes in, in Micah uh, chapter 6, verse 8, where Micah says, He has told you, O, o mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to, but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Now, I, if you're like me, I absolutely love that quotation and the whole idea of God's kindness. I mean, basically, God is, through Micah here, God is showing, or Micah is showing us three pillars uh, of God's love in the world, that idea of, of justice and kindness and humility before God. In Berlin, Tom Berlin says that Micah, Micah is not offering us advice or a hope for the future, but rather Micah is des describing the way that the world works. He says that, uh, Berlin says, that when we act in justice and kindness and humility towards God and towards others, we find a good life. And when we do not, we find frustration, resentment, and indignation. So that essentially Micah is describing the way the world works. We were called to walk in justice and kindness and humility before God. And, and as Berlin says, when we do that, we find a good life. And when we don't do that, uh, we find the kind of frustration and anger and res resentment and indignation and anger that is so prevalent in our culture today. And Berlin also goes on to say that Mike is not telling you and me to create justice and kindness and humility because God has already done that. Instead, Micah is describing the life of a person who's come into a right relationship with God. He's right with God. It's our faith in God's love and justice that can lead us to a, to a hunger to what Jesus says we, we should do, and that is hunger and thirst for righteousness. And from that hunger and thirst for righteousness, we find a conviction that can lead us to courage. You know, a person who is physically thirsty is going to search for water until he finally finds some water. And when we thirst, when we thirst for God's righteousness, then we're going to keep working. We're going to keep getting swatted down, perhaps, but we're going to keep working towards finding God's justice towards fulfilling the call that God has placed on our life. That's what Christ-centered conviction is. So how do we develop this Christ-centered conviction? Because it sounds good, but how do we do that? And where, where do we find the courage that comes from that Christ-centered conviction? Well, Tom Berlin says that we can start by paying attention to the moments when God gets your attention through anger, longing, or urgency. So let's take a look at each of these. Uh, let's talk about God getting our attention through anger. Now, of course, most of the time we don't think of anger as a good thing. And the kind of anger that we see around us so often, this what I would call the selfish kind of anger, that's not the anger that we're talking about. We're talking about uh, the kind of anger that's not motivated by our ego or our self-focus. Uh, we're talking about the kind of, um, what would we call it, righteous anger that, that we see in the prophets and that we see in, in many of the heroes in the Bible that we see in Jesus Christ. You know, harmful anger that's so prevalent in our culture today is, is motivated by, like I said, it, the self-centered. Uh, even if that self-centeredness is that we're wanting to protect uh, our group or our cult or whatever, 
I, I called it a cult. We don't have cults, but <laughs> people talk sometimes about how we have our tribes. You know, we get in our, our little political party or our little group, and we can get very defensive to the point of anger uh, in trying to keep keep our group or our political party or whatever it is safe and away from criticism. Well, that's not the kind of anger we're talking about. We're talking about righteous anger. It's not evoked by something that happens to you or to your little group of friends, but instead that kind of righteous anger comes when we see injustice done to vulnerable people, when we feel like, hey, this is wrong and we ought to do something about it. When we see some form of injustice, uh, Berlin says, when you see some form of injustice and it gives you an unmistakable sense that it's just not right and something needs to be done, then God is trying to evoke courage in you. Now, we need to seek clarity from prayer and, and maybe from talking to other people. But the experience of, of righteous anger, says Berlin, is often God tapping you on the shoulder and, and telling you that he wants you to act. And so he gave an example, Tom Berlin gave an example of righteous anger that came from an experience he had in Sierra Leone. He'd gone there and he was with a group of, of medical missionaries. And they had spent a day in a village trying to bring care and needed medicine to people who just didn't have it. And of course, the lines were long, long, long. The day wore on, the time wore out, the medicine was all gone. And so their host that was there with them had pulled the van up alongside and he, he had them climb out the window and into that van. You know, the van that was like on the back of the building, the, the line was over on the other side. So they, they literally were sneaking out of the building and getting in the van because their host wanted to take off before the people realized uh, that the medicine was gone because he was afraid that they would be knocking each other over in their urgency to run after the, the medical team and try to get help. And of course, you can imagine how terrible uh, Tom Berlin and the doctors and nurses that were with him felt. And he said from that, uh, there were a lot of emotions, but one of the emotions that grew from that was a kind of righteous anger. They were, they were furious, they were angry that, that people could have such desperate need for medical care and for medicine that was so easily obtainable in other parts of the world. And that righteous anger led them, it gave them a conviction that they needed to do something. And through much prayer and through much hard work and, and, and through staying courageous in spite of many obstacles and over a number of years, they finally were able to open in Sierra Leone Mercy Hospital, which serves people who can't afford to pay for medical care or for medicine. That's, uh, that's what, where righteous anger can lead to conviction and give us courage. And of course, the other thing that Berlin said was, let longing lead you. Sometimes longing leads us to have conviction. And he gives, as an example, the story of Mary Magdalene. Luke mentions that Mary Magdalene had been cured of seven demons. Well, we don't know what those seven demons were. You know, sometimes you hear, uh, it's kind of a popular idea, that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. That was something that Unfortunately, a lot of church leaders kind of espouse, but there is no biblical evidence of that. Uh, so we don't know what the seven demons were because the, using the word demons was meant to, to describe a lot of things. It could have been seven physical illnesses. Uh, it could have been, uh, what's the word I want? Emotional illnesses, mental illnesses. Uh, something was plaguing her and it was terrible obviously it, it, she must have been dysfunctional if she had sev seven demons as it were and she probably was the object of scorn and criticism and you know it's kind of funny but sometimes when people have a lot of illnesses or when they're mentally ill we have a tendency as humans to criticize them as if to think well if you just do something things wouldn't be so bad i'm sure she heard uh, those kinds of criticisms, and and uh, she may have heard an inner voice that told her that she was nothing, that she could never 
overcome these problems. Uh, it might have been the same kind of voice that, that tells a person that God doesn't care about you. You're not good enough for God. God can never forgive you. That's, that's the one I hate. That, you know, I, I hurt for people when they feel that way. That, that it's so hard for them to grab a hold of God's grace and believe that God really can forgive you. God really can love you. But, but the, these demons sort of torturing Mary begin to develop in her a deep longing. And, and finally, her longing to be whole, to be made well, created the conviction that enabled her to go to Jesus. You know, she, she had a longing that led to a conviction that she needed to do something. She heard about Jesus. She, she had a longing that led to a conviction that maybe this Jesus can help me. And her longing to be whole created the conviction that enabled her either to ask Jesus for help or to say yes when Jesus offered it. And what a healing he brought. And what a wonderful thing it was, not only for Mary, but really for all of us, because Mary Magdalene became his disciple. Luke will tell us that she was among a group of women that used their own resources basically to support Jesus uh, and his disciples so that they didn't have to worry about material things. She took care of those things uh, along with these other women so that Jesus would be free to help other people like her. And of course, uh, in John's gospel, she's going to be the first person that hears and spreads the news of Jesus's resurrection. She became a faithful disciple when her longing led to conviction, that led to courage, that led her to action. Okay, so that's one of the ways. Uh, and also, uh, we need to pay attention to urgency, is what Tom Berlin said, because urgency can lead to conviction. And uh, an example of that, he said, is the story of the Roman centurion. This is the guy, you remember, he's in, where is this? It's in the seventh chapter, I think, of Luke. Uh, he has a servant that he really cares about, but the, but the man is desperately ill. And I would say that the uh, centurion is desperate to, to help his servant. And he's heard of Jesus Christ. And, and his, his sense of urgency that something has to be done for his servant leads him to, to the conviction that, well, maybe he should see if this Jesus can help. Now, he might not have been completely sure uh, if Jesus was going to be willing to help a Gentile because he sends the leaders of the synagogue to tell Jesus what a great guy this uh, centurion is and to ask if Jesus will come and heal his servant. But then before Jesus even gets there, his, again, his, his urgency uh, has led to even greater conviction because by now this centurion realizes that Jesus doesn't even have to be physically present. He, he sends some servants to tell Jesus, I'm not even worthy that you come under my roof, uh, but speak but the word and my servant will be healed. And so his conviction has led, I mean, his, his desperation and his urgency to have his servant cured has led him to conviction that issued forth in courage. Berlin says, desperation is motivation, motivational. Let me try that again. Desperation is motivational. The more conviction the centurion held about Jesus' capacity and about his servant's need, the more courage grew and the more willing the centurion was to enlist friends to make a bold request of Jesus. It saved his servant's life. So conviction is an important part of leading us to the courage to act and live out the will of God. You know, God can use anger, a longing, and urgency to get our attention. And when we listen, when we turn to God in prayer, when we take time to refocus, when we take time to turn our view away from thinking that everything depends upon me and upon my limited abilities, when we remember the grace of God that loves us and desires for us to share God's love, then we can find the conviction that leads to courage. So my prayer for you this week, my friends, 
is that you can listen to these, these urgings, uh, listen to uh, the times that God gives you righteous anger. And, uh, and the other one, I've forgotten what it is now, <laughs> uh, uh, longings, so that we can turn with conviction and courage to help create the world of justice and love that God desires. May God richly bless you all. Bye-bye now.